Are you married looking for peace? God is never late. Singles and married, married, empowering you to marry. Singles and married, married, living a life of bliss. This is a moment. Jesus. This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice in it and we shall be glad in it in Jesus' name. We shall also be glad in this week. It's a good week. It's a brand new week and all things are new in the name of Jesus. We're going to experience the, the goodness of the week in Jesus' name. This is a good week for you. Your heart desires will manifest in Jesus' name. Every goal you have set this week you shall accomplish effortlessly in Jesus' name. Nothing shall stop you from achieving all your goals this week in Jesus' name. You are unstoppable. You are unstoppable in the name of Jesus. The strength of the Lord will help you actualize your goals effortlessly without stress. The favor of the Lord will be with you throughout this week in everything you do, in everywhere you go, in your thoughts and in your actions. You are favored. In every area of your life, you are favored. In your body, you are favored. In the area of marriage, you are favored. In the area of finance, you are favored. The Lord will protect you. He will be a shield and a buckler over you. He will keep you from the, from the eyes of the evil ones. No evil eyes can see you because the Lord is protecting you. And because he is with you, no one can be against you. No weapon fashioned against you shall prosper. This is a good week for you. I've declared it, and it is so in Jesus' name. So it is in Jesus' mighty name we have prayed. Amen and amen. What a mighty God we serve. Our God is indeed a mighty God. Dear, welcome to Singles and Married Fellowship where we teach singles the right knowledge of marriage that will help them marry rightly and easily. And we also equip the married with the right knowledge that will help them enjoy their marriage. That's what we basically do. It's a very short program, but uh, it's always loaded, fully loaded, you know. And today's teaching is an interesting one. You know, last week I talked about the trick of a right spouse, you know, and today's teaching is connected to that subject, even though it's completely different, but it's somehow connected. You know, many people are not married today because they don't have the complete understanding of the subject matter. And uh, many are not happy in their marriages because they lack the right knowledge of the subject matter. And some are already separated or divorced. So it's essential that we learn about it today even though it's going to be brief, but it's going to be powerful, like always, by the special grace of God. And uh, if you have not shared the video, kindly share the video. If you have not liked the video, like as well, share. And if you are not following me on the, on the platform you are watching from, kindly follow me. We are presently streaming on five platforms. And uh, anyone you are watching from, like or follow or subscribe, depending on the platform you are and uh, let me also know where you are watching from. God bless you, Sister Lillian. Good to see you. And uh, uh, Akoma, God bless you, Sister Akoma. God bless you. 
We are highly blessed in Jesus' name. Sister Mary, open we are blessed. Brother Gide, so good to see you. God bless you. And uh, everyone connected, the Lord is with you. This is a good week for you. The word has gone forth and shall surely be fulfilled in your life in Jesus' name. The word I've declared will not drop on the floor, will not drop on the ground, will be fulfilled in your life in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Without any waste of time, I'll go straight to the word of the day, of the week. And uh, the title, once again, is the trick of a soulmate. The trick of a soulmate. You know, somebody once said to me, Pastor Chris, why is it that your topics usually have something with, to do with tricks? Either you're revealing a trick or you're revealing a secret or you're exposing a trick, one trick of this, trick of that, trick of that. I would like to state that the reason is simple. Most right doctrines are hidden. You know, most correct doctrines of God are not popular. They cannot be famous. Do I have any backing, any scripture to back what I've just said? Yeah. In the book of Ephesians chapter 5, verses 31 and 32, the Bible calls marriage a mystery. And a mystery simply means hidden knowledge. The kind of knowledge that everybody requires. But such knowledge is not available. It's not popular, it's not famous, it's hidden. And if the Bible says that marriage is a mystery, it simply means that the right doctrines of marriage are not popular. They are, they are secrets. So that's why most times I say that I'm, I reveal secrets. Now, talking about tricks, what the devil does in this generation, that's what he has been doing all along, is to deceive people, to make them imbibe wrong doctrines. You know, the devil is not what we th think he is. Many people wrongly assume that the devil is powerful. No, our father is powerful. God is the one who is powerful. We are also powerful because we are children of our father. And God gave us, Jesus gave us authority over the devils. So the devil doesn't have authority over us if you are a child of God. What he does is that he deceives people. So what does he deceive people to do? He deceives people to imbibe wrong doctrines, to accept wrong teachings and practice them. And when a person practices wrong teaching, the result is suffering, struggle, difficulties. The devil knows he cannot afflict a person directly with any form of affliction, but he can deceive a person to imbibe a wrong doctrine. And by so doing, the person will start suffering. That's what he does. That was what he did on Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve suffered so much. Before the deceit of the devil, they had a fantastic life. You know, the dream life anybody would want to have, even, even though we are in Christ Jesus now and had a better you know, kind of life than Adam and Eve had. But everybody will appreciate the kind of life Adam and Eve had. They were in the garden of Eden. They, they didn't struggle at all. They, there was no form of lack in the garden. No sickness existed in the garden. There was no sin. There was no bad thing there. No, nothing of, no bad thing of any kind. No war, nothing bad, until they were deceived. They lost everything. They had authority and power before them, but when the devil deceived them, they, were, they lost their authority, they lost their power, they lost the dominion they had, they were driven out of the garden, they went into a bondage, sickness came into the world, you know, Bondage came, suffering came, hardship came, lack came, because they were deceived. The devil has not changed. There's a scripture I would like to show you, you know, it's taken from the book of Revelation. Revelation. And uh, 
chapter 12, verse 9. The Bible says, and the great dragon was cast out. That old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth, deceiveth the whole world. And he was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. The Bible calls him the old serpent, the dragon, the devil, the Satan. Satan, I beg your pardon. And after giving us the names, the different names you can call him, the Bible now defines him, describes him. And the Bible tells us that he deceives the whole world. He deceives the whole world. That is the best description of the devil. He deceives the whole world. That's what he does. He deceives people every day. That is his assignment. That is his work, to deceive people. And anyone that he deceives suffers in that area of life. What happens is that the devil is very, you know, smart. You know, he deceives people in different areas. And in any particular area, he succeeds in deceiving a person. That person starts suffering in that area. And on the other hand, if you discover the truth in any area of life and you're able to stop the deceit of the devil from having an effect in you or on you, then you will start prospering in that area of life. So the reason many people are not married in this generation is because the devil deceives them. That's what the Bible says. He deceives the whole world. The whole world. Everybody in the world. Including Christians. He deceives everybody. The Bible does not say he, he forces affliction on people. He does not have such ability. He does not have such ability. Now if he can understand that the devil uses tricks and not power on children of God. It will solve so many problems in your life. It will change your mindset. You will start feeling better. He deceives people. That's what the Bible says. He deceives. He uses tricks. That's the only thing he does. That's the best description of the devil. And it's from the Bible. I didn't write it. There's no scripture that says he has power or that uses power. No Bible passage says that. How much more having power over a child of God? Do you know what it means to be a child of God? Do you think it's, it's, it's a joke? Or this, think all these stories are fairy tale? That you think the Bible is a fairy tale? If you're a child of God, then why should you think that the devil has more power than you. He does not. And he has never claimed to have, if you are a child of God. Mark my words, if you are a child of God. What he does is to deceive people. He deceives the whole world. The reason many people find it difficult getting married is because the devil has deceived them. They may be smart, they may be intelligent, they may be professors. But they are professors in one subject, in an area. So you can deceive them in another area. If you know so, a particular one does not mean you know everything. We all know in part. He deceived Adam and Eve and they suffered. Even though they had a good relationship with God. They were always praying, talking to God. If, if prayer means communication with God. They were always communicating with God. Every day. God would come down in the cool of the evening and fellowship with them. They were fellowshipping with him. Genuine fellowship. And yet, when they were deceived, they started suffering. So, prayer does not exempt somebody from suffering. That's what I'm trying to say to you. Because there are some people who don't understand why they should, why they should struggle in any area of life, irrespective of the fact they pray always. That you pray always does not exempt you from suffering. Once a person is deceived by the devil... Such a person suffers in that area of life, whether they pray fervently or not, whether they are well behaved or not. The result of any successful deceit in a person's life is struggle, suffering, affliction. 
Hence, many people are not married, not because they don't pray enough, not because they are not smart, not because they are not beautiful or well-behaved, not because they are not good Christians, but because they are deceived by the devil. Many are not happy in their marriage because of the same reason. Many experience separation or divorce because of the same reason. And contrarily, when one discovers any of the trick or finds out the truth, such a person starts prospering in that area of life. And this afternoon, I will reveal to you one of the tricks the devil uses in causing late marriage, disappointment in marriage, separation and divorce. And it is called the trick of a soulmate. The trick of a soulmate. The trick of a soulmate. What is the trick of a soulmate? The trick of a soulmate, if you look on your screen, I, I prepared a definition for you. The trick of a soulmate, uh, hold on. Hold on, I beg your pardon. Hold on. I, I, sorry, I thought a, a mistake there. Okay. So if you look at your screen, you see the trick of a soulmate is the trick the devil uses to make Christians believe that there's oh there's still another mistake there. Come on, hold on a second. Okay, it's correct. It's the trick the devil uses to make Christians believe that there's a particular spouse meant for everyone. So the devil uses this trick to make people believe that everyone has someone destined to be their spouse. So many men believe that there's a particular woman meant to be their wife, that they cannot just marry anyone. Likewise, many women believe that there's a particular man meant for them, that they cannot just marry any man. I know that some of you listening to me this afternoon actually believe that there's a particular one destined to be your spouse. But I want you to know that it's a trick. It is the devil that has, you know, perpetuated that trick into the system, has brought that trick into the system to make people experience late marriage, unhappiness in marriage, divorce, and separation. Unfortunately, many people, especially Christians, have imbibed this trick, this wrong doctrine. They believe it, they practice it, and the result is frustrations in marriage, unhappiness in marriage, you know, separation, and even divorce. And those who are not married find it difficult getting married because they believe that as a particular person meant for them. But today I want you to know that it's a trick. There's no particular person destined to be your spouse. No one was born to be your spouse. It is your prerogative to choose your spouse. It is your duty. It is your responsibility to choose your spouse. God does not do that. This topic is an important topic, you know. And I've been teaching this subject for years, for many years since I started this work. And a few years ago, I discovered something. I was discussing with a lady, you know, who was not yet married then, but had listened to my teaching for many years, you know, had followed me for many years, but was still single. I was discussing with her one particular day, and uh, we, we talked about, you know, choosing of a spouse, you know, Someone wanted to, someone was interested in marrying her. So we talked about it and uh, she didn't like the person, you know, and, uh, and uh, I was surprised when she made a statement. She said to me, 
that she still does not understand, you know, why God wouldn't give her a good husband in spite of the of how she has served the Lord, you know, and kept herself for the Lord, that it was still a mystery to her. And I told her, I reminded her, my teachings, that it's not God's responsibility to choose your spouse, that it is your duty. And she laughed. I became curious. I asked her why she laughed. She said that she has been listening to the teaching that she just want to be truthful to me that even though the teaching is clear, but that she still finds it difficult to comprehend it, to accept the fact that God cannot give her what she wants, that God should be able to give her a husband. That if God can give her this, give her that, why wouldn't God give her a husband? Then I started talking again. I started talking and talking and talking. But the more I tried to explain to her, the more she gave me reasons not to believe that there's no particular person destined to be her spouse. Finally, she said, okay, even if there's no particular person, that God can still do something. So it was then I realized that this topic is not, it's not just as simple as it looks or as the teaching is. Because to me, it is simple, but to some persons, it may not look simple, okay? I then realized that the, my ability to teach the message in a way that people will see it as simple, you know, to simplify the message in the eyes of my listeners, we make them, we enable them to understand it the way I am able to understand it, which is my goal. And that's why I decided that I will not just teach it as a topic, I will, you know, like this month, we're going to be talking more of right spouse. We're going to be talking about choosing a spouse. We're going to be talking about from different perspectives to make sure that no matter if whether you have understood me before or not, by the end of this month, issue, you will become an authority in the area of church or spouse. You'll be able to understand it in a manner that will help you, you know, make your choice effortlessly. Because what we understand determines the kind of experiences we can have in life. Please write it down. Your understanding determines your experience. You cannot have the kind of experience that is beyond your understanding. If you can't believe, in fact, you can't believe what you don't understand. And if you don't believe, it can't, cannot happen. Don't forget, it is only what you believe that happens to you. But for you to believe, there must be a good understanding. The, that's what the Bible says, faith comes by hearing and hearing and hearing and hearing the word. The more you hear, the more you understand, the more you believe, and the more you have faith. And, on. and the more things happen in your life, the things you want. That's why nothing can take the place of knowledge in the kingdom. Knowledge is power. Today, I will show you how this trick of a soulmate causes late marriage. I will also show you how it causes frustration in marriage, separation, and divorce. But before doing that, it's vital I take you to the scripture. I should go to the Bible and use the scripture to prove to you that there's no one destined to be your spouse. No one is destined to be your husband or your wife. And I will use the marriage of Adam and Eve. Why have I chosen that marriage? It was the very first marriage that took place on earth. So everything about that marriage must be good. The doctrines practicing the marriage must be good. Not only that, it was God that conducted the wedding himself. So every doctrine practiced in the marriage must be correct. So the question now is, was Eve destined to marry Adam? Or were, were Adam and Eve destined to marry themselves? Were they destined? In other words, was 
Adam created to be Eve's husband? <laughs> the answer is no. Adam was not destined to marry Eve. How do I know that? I'll show you in a scripture that proves it. Genesis chapter 2 verse 18 says, And the Lord God said, It's not good that the man should be alone. I will make him and help me for him. Now, if we will talk about destinies, destinies are established before a person is born. In other words, the reason a person is born is to fulfill a particular destiny. And in other words, before the person is born, that destiny must be established. Then the person will be born to fulfill that destiny. So if a man, for example, is destined to marry a woman, a particular woman, so the man will be born to be that woman's husband. So even before the man is born, it's already established that that is the husband, that she, he will be the husband of a particular woman, whether that woman is born yet or not. But in this case, that's not the situation. The Bible tells us that God created Adam. After creating Adam, he created other animals. Rested. They realized that it wasn't good for Adam to be alone. He realized that it wasn't good for him to be alone. He noted it in verse 18. After the creation, when Adam had been, Adam had even started living his life, he started playing with the animals in the garden. Then God noted that it wasn't good for him to be alone. That he did not note it before the creation. Rather, it was noted after the creation of Adam. So Adam had already lived his life before God decided to create a wife for him. That means. It was not established before the creation of Adam. And if it was not established, it means that Adam was not destined to be Eve's husband. I don't know if you get him. I will give you room to ask questions at the end of today's teaching. So in verse 18, the Bible says, after noting Adam shouldn't be alone, he made a decision. He said, I will make him a helper for him. So he decided to make a helper for Adam after Adam had lived his life. He did not make that decision before Adam was born. If, it was, if Adam was destined to marry Eve, that destiny would have been established before Adam was born, not after his birth, not after his creation. But it was in verse 18, when Adam was already enjoying his life, playing with the animals that God decided, that was when he made a decision to create a helper for him. And that helper was Eve, his wife. So this also means that if you're a man listening to me, you're not married yet, it means that before you were born, you are not destined to marry any woman. If you're a woman listening to me, it also implies that you are not destined to marry any man. There's no particular person meant to be your spouse. There's no particular person. Even though many people teach this wrong doctrine in the kingdom, in the church, but the teaching is not correct. The right one is that God wants you to make your choice. He wants you to make your choice. If you want to carry him along in the choice making, fine. He will order your steps, but he will not choose for you. He does not choose our spouses for us. That is the procedure. That is the protocol. He doesn't choose for us. It is our responsibility to make that choice for ourselves. When one believes that it is God's duty you know, to, to tell him who is meant for him or her, they may experience late marriage. And if they eventually marry, they will not be happy in their marriage. I will tell you how soon. But before that, I would like to answer a question. 
if there's no doctrine of soulmate in the entire Bible, because from the book of Genesis to the end in the book of Revelation, there's no relationship in the Bible that or any person that had a soulmate, you know, as a wife or as a husband. Nothing like that in the entire Bible. Nothing like that. So if it's not in the scripture, how then, you know, did it originate? How did it start? How did it start? What is the origin of soulmate? I will tell you the origin. Then I will tell you the problem it causes. Then I will share with you the solution. Then I give you room to ask a few questions. What is the origin of a soulmate? The first mention of the word soulmate was in 370 BC. And it was mentioned by a man called Aristophanes. Aristophanes was a comedian. He is regarded to date as the father of ancient comedy. You know, this stand-up comedy that people do. Aristophanes is the father of ancient comedy. In 370 BC, there was a man called Plato. Plato organized a symposium. You know, and that symposium is today referred to as the symposium. So if you Google this, the word symposium, the symposium, I'd give you the article, the symposium, it will, it will bring out the symposium, the Plato symposium in 370 BC. You know, it's become popular today among so many scholars. People study research on the symposium. It was a huge success. You know, in that symposium, he had several speakers, you know, who, who performed, who spoke. And one of the speakers was Aristophanes, the, the father of ancient comedy. Aristophanes performed his comedy at that symposium. He spoke. And when he got to Aristophanes' turn to speak, he cracked a joke. And in the joke, he explained that man originally had two heads, four hands, four legs, and two sexual organs, one male and female organs, one male and uh, one male and one female, one male organ and one female organ. In other words, that everybody initially had two heads, four hands, four legs, and everybody also had two sexual organs, one male and one female. But because of that, man was powerful, and man started challenging God. When man started challenging God, God decided to split man into two and divided everyone on earth into two. After the splitting, man then had one head because man was split into two, okay, in the middle. So man then had one head, two hands, two legs, and one sexual organ, either a male or a female sexual organ, because man was split into two. So after the splitting, Aristophanes continued that man had been searching for his other half, his other half to experience you know, full love, to experience full happiness and the, the you know, complete love. And he ended his, his uh, comedy, his joke, by stating that that other half, that second half, that other half that the man has been searching for is the man's soulmate. And the joke made people happy. People screamed and they were clapping, they laughed, some fell on the ground while laughing. It was funny. The man had two heads and two hands, one set, two sexual organs and all that. People laughed. So because the, phone, the joke was a success, many comedians started cracking jokes in that area. Not only that, many authors started writing books on soulmates. Many movie producers started producing movies on so, about soulmates. So it started trending as far back as 370 BC to the extent that in this present era, the word soulmate can be found in our dictionaries. It has been added in English dictionaries. 
So you find it in virtually all the English dictionary, the word sonnet. But the problem here is that, now listen to this. In, if you check the English dictionary, the word sonnet is usually defined as someone that is ideally suitable or suited to you. Someone that is ideally, ideally suitable for you, you know, in a, for a relationship. You know, that's the usual definition. But unfortunately, people don't believe that that is the meaning of summit. Most people believe that a summit means someone that was that is meant to be your spouse. That's what people believe that summit means, or someone that is destined to be your spouse. Even though the dictionary defines it as someone ideally suitable. People are searching for someone that is meant to be their spouse. So it's a major cause of late marriage. The misunderstanding of the term soulmate, the trick of soulmate, is a major cause of late marriage, disappointment. Many men are not married. It's because it's separation and divorce. Don't forget that. But let me first talk about, talk how, explain how it causes late marriage and disappointment before talking about how it affects the marriage. When a man, for example, believes that, a, that he has a soulmate, that he, he, there's a woman meant to be his wife, what happens to him is that it affects his mindset. Then he will start searching for the woman that is destined to be his wife. And unfortunately for him, he would have that understanding that if he marries any other woman that was not meant to be his wife, he will be having, his marriage would be a failure. He will be having troubles in his marriage. And for him to enjoy his marriage, he would need to marry that woman that is meant to be his wife. Then he starts searching for her. But unfortunately, such a woman does not exist. Exist. So he cannot find her. Hence, the result is late marriage. Disappointments. Because if he, if he eventually meets a woman, maybe thinking that she's meant to be his wife, then he would have that understanding that if she's meant to be his wife, they would have a good understanding that is different from the kind of understanding he has had with women in the past. Because if this one is meant to be his wife, everything will work well for both of them. There will be no conflict of any sort. Since they will have a good understanding, they will have good reports, everything will work fantastically well. So he would have high expectations and start studying her. But after a while, he would realize that she's not meant to be his wife because they would definitely have issues. They will have conflict. Then he would feel that she was not meant to be his wife. What happens? He dumps her, breaks her heart. Even when he loves her, he may be scared of marrying her. He will be because he has been warned that if he does not marry a woman that's not meant to be his wife, he may not be happy in marriage. And he wants to be happy in marriage. What does he do? He dumps her and starts searching for another girl that is meant for her. But there's no woman meant for him, so he can't find her. If he meets anyone, it will not work out. I can categorically tell you that some 50 year, 50 years old men are still searching for a woman meant for them. They've never been married before since they were born. Some have some have studied more than 10 women. In other words, they've 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 tried marrying more than 10 women. You no, know, one after the other. They will try going to the relationship, dump them, going to the relationship, dump them, on and on and on, breaking women's hearts. In other words, they've broken 10 different women, women's hearts. Because of misunderstanding, because of the trick of a soulmate, that's how the devil operates. That has, that's how he operates. And when you see such people, they'll be fasting and praying, asking God to help them. Meet that woman that was meant for them. It's an error. 
If no one in the Bible prayed such a prayer, why would you pray in that manner in this generation? Has God changed? He does not change. I know that this teaching may sound strange to you, probably because you've not had me teach this bit of law, or you've not had anyone teach it. But it is the truth, and I'm using the Bible. We have been listening to wrong teachings for a long time. We need to stop. We have to start studying the word of God ourselves. Because when one practices a wrong doctrine, the result is problems, afflictions, struggle. When you know the truth, you'll be set free. That's what the Bible says. Many women are still single today, not because they're not well behaved or beautiful, but because they wrongly believe that there's a particular man meant to be their husband. So they meet men, but inside them, they believe that they cannot marry anyone, that there's one particular one they can marry. And because of such belief, what happens? Their minds will be closed against men who are not created to be their husband and be open only to that man that was created to be their husband. And because there's no man created to be their husband, their hearts will be closed against all men. That's what it means. So men will suddenly lose interest in marrying them. Men will lose interest in talking to them. Instead, they'll be asking them to talk to, to their friends. You know, They want to marry their friend, not them. Because they close their mind against men. And if a man mistakenly comes to them, the relationship may not work. Why? Because that man is not the man they are looking for. Even when they know the man is not the man they are looking for, but deliberately accept just because they want to marry, the relationship may still not work because their mind has been made up that that man is not that one they are looking for. There's someone else they are looking for. Someone else that they will be happy to meet. They're not even happy meeting this one. They're just managing it. So at the end of the day, the relationship may not work. There are some women who have proposals every now and then. They meet men every now and then. But because of this singular reason, they are still single. Because within them, they know that that man or the people they meet are not the ones, are not that, I, I, none of them is that particular man God created for them. So the result is heartbreak. Men will keep on breaking their heart. This are, they experience disappointment. So this is a serious issue. It's not a joke. It's a serious issue. It affects both men and women. It affects the marriage as well. Many married people are unhappy in their marriage today because of this reason. If a man and a woman, for example, meet themselves before getting married and for one reason believe that they were meant for each other and get married, they've made the biggest mistake of their life. You know why? They would both wrongly believe that they are a perfect match because they are meant for each other. So the man will then have high expectations. You know, he will expect so much from the wife because the truth is that if you get married to someone meant to be your spouse, there'll be no fault in that marriage, no single mistake. Everything will work perfectly well. So if a man has that wrong notion that the wife was meant to be his wife, then he would have high expectations. He would believe that the relationship must be a perfect one. The wife cannot annoy him. He would expect so much from the wife. But unfortunately, the wife cannot fulfill his expectations. The wife cannot. So the wife from time to time will make mistakes because she's not perfect. But the, the wrong notion will make him wrongly see the wife as a perfect being, even though he will come, 
regularly confess that she, he knows the wife is not perfect, but within him he's expecting perfect behavior from the wife, meaning he, he does not know that he sees the wife as a perfect being. On the other hand, the wife sees him as a perfect husband too, because she believes that he was he's meant for to be he, her wife, he, her husband. I beg your pardon. So the wife would have high expectations, would expect him to behave perfectly, and unfortunately for her, he does not have such ability. No imperfect being has the ability to be perfect in any form of relationship. Only a mad person will expect per perfect behavior from an imperfect being. No imperfect being can has the ability of having a perfect relationship. Write it down, please. This is important. I repeat it again. No imperfect being has the ability of having a perfect relationship. It's not possible. It's not possible. But when two persons get married, believing that they are a perfect match, that they were meant for each other, they will start expecting perfect behaviors from each other. But unfortunately for them, they can't have it. When one puts up an irregular behavior, the other will be disappointed. And if cast not taking the disappointment, will lead to frustration. And from frustration to separation or, or divorce. Some are not divorced. Some are not separated, but they are highly frustrated in their marriage. They are not happy at all. They are not happy at all. Not because they ought to be unhappy in their marriage, but because they're expecting so much from their spouse. That, that, that somebody's unhappy in their marriage does not mean that the person's spouse is bad. It does not mean that. It simply means that that person's expectations are high, very high. Only God can meet the person's expectations. The, the person's spouse cannot meet the expectations. The person is expecting too much from the spouse. Too much. Too much. Too much. That's why God is in a relationship with us and is not frustrated. Have you thought of that? Because he does not have, he does not expect perfect, you know, he knows we are not perfect. He knows that. But people don't know that in marriage. They expect perfect behaviors. Perfect behaviors. If I, if I told you that some people quarrel because their wives didn't prepare a delicious meal. Would you believe me? Or maybe the, a woman uh, prepares a meal and it's too salty. Do you know that salt can lead to serious quarrel? Serious quarrel that if he has not taken, you know, they'll have serious issues in their mind. Do you agree with me that some quarrel because of the maybe the man doesn't have money? You know, the wife needs money to do certain things and the man doesn't have it or doesn't provide, and that's a quarrel. That will lead to quarrel. I'm not saying that any of them is good, but that's when you have under an understanding of what I'm teaching you, you realize that the person you get married is not a perfect being. He he or she is bound to make mistakes. It's normal. <laughs> it's normal to make mistakes. It's not abnormal. It's normal. It's abnormal when you don't find any fault in your spouse. There's something wrong. <laughs> something is heavily wrong. This is not a joke. Something is heavily wrong. Are you with me? So when a man realizes that a wife is not meant for him, then he will stop making any efforts to make the marriage work. He would feel that no matter what he does, the marriage cannot work because he got married to a woman that's not meant for him. And don't forget, before his wedding, he already had that belief that for your marriage to succeed, you must marry someone meant for you. And he thought 
he had, he, had, he got married to a woman meant for him. But after the wedding, he realized that the wife was not meant for him because of the frequent conflicts. So for that reason, he would feel that he made a mistake in his choice of spouse, that he had married a wrong wife, that he had, if he had married someone else, then he would start remembering his past girlfriends. He would start contacting them. He would feel that they would have made a better wife. But they were there. He didn't marry them. He would start calling them off. He would start getting close to them, thinking that he made a mistake. The wife, on the other hand, will no longer be happy in the marriage because the husband wouldn't be treating her well again. Then she will start regretting the choice of the spouse. She would feel that if she had, if she had married so-so person, she would have been happier in marriage. Then she, she on her own will stop making any effort. She will stop making any effort to make their marriage work. She would feel that no matter what she does, their marriage cannot work. And because none of them makes any effort to make the marriage work, the marriage will start going down, continue going down until it will crash because nobody's making an effort to keep the marriage. So the marriage will eventually crash. So this way is a major cause of separation and divorce. And when it doesn't cause separation and divorce, the couple may be unhappy, highly unhappy, highly unhappy. It's a serious issue. It's a serious issue. What is the solution to this pandemic? Because it is a serious issue. What is the solution? The first thing is to realize that there's no one meant to be your husband or wife. No one is meant to be your spouse. God has given us free will. You know, we are a free moral agent. You know, we have the, the right to make our choices. What, what is called willpower. God wants you to choose who will be your spouse. It is your choice. There's no one meant to be your spouse. That is the first thing you have to understand. If you want to be out of this, if you, want to want, you don't want this trick to affect you. The second, you know, truth you must understand is that the person you marry is not the determinant of the success of your marriage. The success of your marriage lies in your hands and not in the hands of your spouse. You must not leave it in the hands of your spouse because your spouse may have left it in your hands. So you have to make an effort to see that your marriage will work. The third truth is that you must focus on tolerating your spouse forgiving your spouse and working on your marriage. No matter who you marry, that person will do some unpleasant things. No matter how nice the person is, the person will always annoy you. And if you don't tolerate, you will not be happy in the marriage. You'll be frustrated. And if God's not taken, you may want to leave the marriage. Even though that person is not as bad as you think. You only see the person as a bad person because of your... your understanding of life because of your inability to tolerate your spouse because you expect so much from your spouse. You expect your spouse to behave like a perfect being. You expect your spouse to live without making a mistake. You expect your spouse you know, to, re to relate without any fault at all, you know, to be faultless. So when you see any mistake in your spouse, you become angry. And you find it difficult to forgive and tolerate. But when you understand that you know, mistakes are normal you know, with imperfect beings, meaning that your spouse is, who is an imperfect being is bound to make mistakes. And when the mistakes come, you have to tolerate them. Did you know that your spouse may go out of their way to make you happy? And that very thing they will do to make you happy we make you angry. You become very angry and start shouting. Even call them wicked. <laughs> Yet they go out of their way to make you happy. He said they're wicked for the, for, because of what they did. You regard them as wicked people. <laughs> so
So you need to have that understanding. In fact, we're going to do a program, you know, I'm going to do a marriage school maybe in the, in the month of April, you know, for those who are about getting married and newlyweds, to, to really teach what marriage is all about. For the first time, I'll be teaching that, to teach what marriage is all about. Because people go into marriage without knowing what it is, what it means, what it, what is expected of them, you know. I'll be doing that school, you know, for the first time in April. I've not taught that subject before. So if you're married and you're under the unction of my voice, if you want to enjoy your marriage, understand that your spouse was not meant to be your spouse, was not created, was not destined to be your wife or husband. That is the first step of enjoying your marriage. Because when you think your spouse was meant to be your spouse, you expect so much from him or her. So your victory comes by first understanding that your spouse was not meant to be your spouse. And because you are not meant to be husband and wife, you have to tolerate your spouse. You know, that's why our forefathers had a better marriage system than what we have in this era. Before 1980 in Africa, people got married without studying themselves. People, in fact, some men married women before meeting them. The marriage would take place before they would meet the woman. You know, like in some cases in Africa, a man may not see a woman until the family, the family members will go in search of a wife for him. When they see a woman, they like they will propose marriage to the woman on behalf of the man without the man's notice, without the man being there, the woman may accept, even with, before seeing the man, not, not knowing anything about the man. This, and, and, and I lost a typical example of this marriage is in the scripture too. That's how Isaac got married to Rebecca. Rebecca accepted to marry Isaac without seeing him. It was the servant of Abraham that proposed marriage to Rebecca on behalf of Isaac. Rebecca didn't see Isaac to accept the marriage proposal. And he followed the servant to live with Isaac. Isaac, on the other hand, did not see the wife before the servant proposed marriage to her. And they had a fantastic marriage. This kind of marriage was very common in Africa before the year 1980. Very common. Very common. My father did not see my mother before he proposed marriage to her. They didn't see. It was my auntie that saw my mother, liked her, and told my father about my mother. And they got married. Fantastic. And they had a fantastic marriage. <laughs> you know, that's how people got married before 1980. Until the wrong teachings started creeping in, into the church, into the society. So now people are searching for what they don't even know about. They don't know about it. They just some tell they are just searching. That when they see what they are searching for, they will recognize them. The devil is, is wicked, very wicked. It's wicked. So our forefathers got married to people, even people they didn't know. And realizing that for the marriage to work, they needed to work on the marriage. They needed to work on themselves. They needed to tolerate their spouses to make sure the marriage wouldn't break down, break up. But in this era, people studied themselves. After studying, they would believe that they were meant for each other. And for that reason, for their hands, they don't tolerate, they don't work, they don't make any efforts to, you know, to, see, to make their marriage work. They fold their hands, believing they were meant for each other. And the result is unhappiness, frustration, and divorce. But in those days, they would realize that they were not meant for each other. And for that reason, and because they didn't know themselves, they needed to work on their marriage if they would enjoy it. So they would make effort. They would tolerate. The wife would make a mistake. The man would say, don't worry. I know it's not easy for you. We're just meeting. Take it easy. It will be fine. With time, you will learn. It's simple. The man will make a mistake. The woman will say, don't worry, my Lord. It's easy. 
It's just that you're not used to this. You're just marrying for the first time. You don't know how it is. With time, you will understand that yeah, it's your duty to, you know, to, to take care of your, your family. No, 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 just with time. It's time, time. <laughs> but people are in a hurry. They're desperate to be happy. So people marry today, they want to, everything they want, they want it that same year. It doesn't work like that. It doesn't work like that. The more you stay with a person, the more you understand how to be happy in that marriage. It takes time. It takes time. Do you know how many years it takes? It takes a lifetime. <laughs> 50 years will not be enough to learn it. A lifetime until the person passes on. But the good thing about it is that the, oh, the longer you stay in the marriage, the easier it is to understand. It, unless, of course, that person is being deceived by the devil. I showed you, is the deceiver of the whole world. Unless the person is being deceived by the devil and the person has a wrong orientation of marriage. So that person may never be happy. No matter what you do to make that person happy, you're wasting your time. until the person's understanding changes. You have to share this message for everybody to hear this truth. Download it, the, the, the audio version. Give to your friends, your loved ones. Let them know the truth. The deceit is too much. So if you're married under the unction of my voice, my counsel is this. Accept your spouse the way they are. Don't try to change your spouse. Accept them the way they are, with their faults, with, the, with their weaknesses. Accept them the way they are. You didn't, you don't have, did, are you the one that created them? Accept them the way they are. You have faults yourself. If you, if you don't accept them the way they are, you will not be happy. The advice I'm giving you is for your own good. I'm not asking you to sympathize with your spouse. If you're, it's for your own good. If you want to be happy, you already married, accept your spouse the way they are. Stop tolerating your spouse. Forgive your spouse when your spouse does something unpleasant. Work on your marriage. Then you, suddenly you become happy. <laughs> yeah. There's no shortcut. Don't let anybody deceive you. Instead of you focusing on praying and praying, you want your spouse to change. You change first. Accept your spouse the way they are. You change by accepting your spouse. Start tolerating. Because if you don't tolerate, you will not be happy. You'll be unhappy. Tolerance helps us to be happy even when something unpleasant happens. We'll still be happy because we are tolerating it. If you don't tolerate that bad thing, the unpleasant thing will make you un unhappy and frustrated. So it's for your own good. <laughs> it's not for my own good. It's for yours. It's not for your spouse's good. It's for your own good. That's what I'm saying. So accept your spouse the way they are. Tolerate them when they do something unpleasant. Forgive them. Work on your marriage and you'll be surely be happy. If you are not yet married, my counsel is simple. If you are a woman under the unction of my voice, I want you to understand that there's no particular man meant to be your husband. If you can understand this and believe it, the effect is that you will have a change of mind. Your mindset will change. What will happen? You, your mind will no longer be searching for a man that was created for you. Your mind will then become open to receive a marriage proposal from any kind of man. So, the best, uh, so because of that, because your mind is now open, men will suddenly become interested in marrying you. They will start indicating interest in marrying. They will start proposing to you. You may see something you like. You may see something you don't like. It doesn't matter. When a man you don't like proposes marriage to you, it's not a bad thing. Don't feel insulted. The only reason they come to you is because something good is happening. So you don't have to accept, but don't feel insulted. Don't feel offended. Then expect more. Then you see the one you like. But I don't teach people to be too choosy. That's another topic. Some people are too choosy. 
they're looking for a perfect man, you know, that does not exist. <laughs> Instead of look, look, waiting for a perfect man, why not marry somebody, you know, that has the fear of God and then make the person that perfect man you want him to be. That's your work as a, a wife to help him, make him become that thing you want him to be. It's possible. Instead of looking for that ready-made one that does not exist, you make him to become the type you want. So when a, a woman's mindset changes and she understands that uh, there's no particular man meant to be her husband, many men will suddenly become interested in her. She can get proposals on online, on Facebook, YouTube. You know, if she goes out, any man that sees her will suddenly become interested and the people will just be coming. Then she has to make a choice. And let me advise you, women, if you are, anytime you have lots of proposals, you know, at the same time, you better make a choice, please. Choose one from the lots coming. Don't start waiting and say waiting and waiting and waiting because it may not continue coming in that number forever. So when they, when they come plenty like that at once, make a choice from the Lord. You can't tell me that from 10 persons or from five persons, you can't see one person that you can marry. You don't have to marry someone that will have all the qualities you want. There are some qualities you will need to help the man, you know, get, you know, as the man's help me, you remember? You help him. It doesn't have to be 100%. You know, but the cardinal ones should be there. Especially the man must be born again, must be a genuine Christian. If you are a true Christian, that's the one that cannot be compromised. That's the main thing. That's what matters to God. But the other, every other thing is a choice. It's a choice. Mm -hmm. So get married. If you're a man and you're not married, I challenge you to marry. Stop searching for a, that perfect woman. You know, she does not exist. Make a choice. What matters is that you marry a Christian, a true Christian woman. That's what matters most. That's the only condition in the Bible. And how do you know if a lady is a genuine Christian? You have to be genuine yourself before you can identify a genuine Christian. You know, the Bible says that the Spirit of God in you will bear witness that we are sons of that we are sons of God. So there must be that inner witness before you know. And for that inner witness to exist, you must have the Holy Ghost in you. You must carry the Holy Ghost in you. So th that's what matters most. Once you show somebody has the fear of God, then you can go on and get married. A woman that has the fear of God will not misbehave, not because she loves you, but because she has the fear of God. She will not plan evil against you. She will not plan to kill you, not because she loves you, but because she has the fear of God. Vice versa, a man that has the fear of God will not plan evil against the wife, not because he loves her, but because he has the fear of God. And the person that has the fear of God will be, we you know, accept the scripture, we listen to the scripture, we take counsel and advice that will bring to reconciliation if you have any issue in the marriage. The person that has fear of God will not do something nasty to the spouse. They will always be in the marriage and they will be happy in their marriage because they have the fear of God. The person that has the fear of God will not think of leaving the spouse. Unless, of course, that's a reason beyond the person's, you know, uh, understanding or what the person cannot handle, which we have re very rare uh, uh, reasons like that. But I just want you to understand that you must accept your spouse the way they are if you're married, work on your marriage, you'll be happy. If you're not married, then get married, especially if you're a man. Get married, stop searching for someone, you know, that will make you happy. What matters is that you marry a true Christian. It is not your spouse's 
responsibility to make you happy in your marriage. Your spouse cannot make you happy. Our happiness comes from God. Apart from that, it's a decision you have to make to be happy. If you rely on your spouse to make you happy, you'll be very frustrated in your marriage, believe me. Because your spouse is imperfect. How can you rely on an imperfect being to make you happy? Do you think that's wisdom? That's not wisdom. If if you must rely on someone to make you happy, let that person be a perfect being like God. And you'll be happy. But if you rely on an imperfect being to make you happy, you'll be very frustrated. You'll be very frustrated. So you focus on making your spouse happy. (laughs) Rather than waiting for your spouse to make you happy. You make your spouse happy. And you become happy. (laughs) It's wisdom. (laughs) If I am not married, please look for somebody. This Easter is close, but it's not a bad time to propose. Even if you can perform the marriage rites before Easter, you can get somebody and start planning. You can do the introduction by Easter and fix a date. Don't be scared. You must have faith in the Lord. (laughs) Don't be scared. I married my wife 21 days after finding her. Before then, I suffered. I suffered. I was searching for a perfect woman that did not exist. When I found out, I realized that she had a fear of God. I did not waste time again. Three weeks, 21 days, I paid her bride price. If you're a man, you're not married, you can marry now. You need to marry. Marriage is good. It is not good to be single. God said it, it is not good. And it is the truth, it is not good. It is bad to be single. It is evil to be single. You have to get married. It is good to marry. Even though people quarrel every day, marriage is still good. (laughs) They quarrel because they lack the understanding. These little things, what people call little things I'm sharing with you, may be little, but they are very powerful. If you practice them, your marriage will be sweet. You will enjoy your marriage. Did you know that the same reason people divorce, there are some people that the, the same act, the same act that, that leads to divorce in, in certain marriages, the same act happens in multiplied dimensions in certain marriages and they're still happy in their marriage. They're very happy. <laughs> It's understanding. The difference is just understanding. And that's why I try to teach you to understand in a very simple manner. May the Lord bless this teaching in your heart. In Jesus' name. What a mighty God we serve. Can I take one or two questions? If you do have, if not, we'll pray and close the meeting. And I'm going to put a link on the comment section of every platform where we are Please try and share this with you. And if you're not following, if you're not following me on the platform you are watching from, follow me. If you're watching from Facebook, you know, follow me. If you're on YouTube, subscribe. In any platform you are watching from, then try to follow me and turn on your notifications so that you know anytime I'm live. Okay. I'm putting the link now. That's the link. So click on it if you have a question. I don't usually take questions, but I think there may be one or two persons who would need to ask a question for for clarification purposes. So you can click and connect and ask your question. So the link, I believe, is is on all all the comments uh, sections of all the platform. And... uh, I'll wait for a while. If not, then uh, I will, will pray and close the meeting. And don't forget, we have this week, Saturday, we have a big program coming up on Saturday morning, the 18th of March. It's titled The Impossible is Nothing. You know, at that program, we're going to emphasize that there's nothing impossible. So I don't care what your needs are, what your desires are, there's nothing impossible in life. All things are possible. We started the program, the edition last last month, February was the meeting edition. It was awesome. 
The second one is coming on the 18th of March, and it will be at 6 a.m. Nigerian time. Don't miss that program. By all means, attend and invite your loved ones, whether single or married, and those who need the healing power of God should also attend, okay? It's online, and now it's going to be awesome at 6 a.m. on my social media platforms, and uh, it's going to be awesome. The 18th, and we're going to have a school of marriage starting immediately uh, two days after from the 20th of March to the 24th of March. And it will be online as well. The school will be on Zoom. Okay, so you need to register so you get the Zoom link. And to register for the school, visit my Facebook page. Scroll down until you see the, the marriage school uh, 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 flyer. Then click on the link. You see the marriage school form on the flyer. Then click on the link and register for the school. The school is free, completely free. We'll have two sessions. Morning session is at 10 a.m. Nigerian time, while the evening session is at 8 p.m. So you choose to attend either the morning session or the evening session for five days, free. And the topic we're talking about in this school is this love thing, this love thing. We're gonna talk everything about love, love in relationships. That's what we're gonna be doing, and it's gonna be Awesome, it's gonna be awesome. Don't miss that. So, believing there's no question, we're gonna pray and close the meeting. I want you to begin to thank God, thank Him for the word you have heard today, thank Him, and ask that the evidence that the word you've heard today is from God shall manifest in your life. Now, anytime you hear the true word of God, something good happens in your life. It cannot have the true word of God without an evidence. Something must happen. That's why the Bible tells us that anytime Jesus preached, the power of God is released for good things to happen. Luke chapter 5, verse 17. As Jesus was teaching in the house, the power of God was available to heal, to bless. Anytime the true word of God is preached, the power of God is available to heal. Now open your mouth and speak, for that power is in the house. Whatever you want, speak. That power will manifest and help you actualize your goals effortlessly in the name of Jesus. Open your mouth and begin to declare what exactly do you want? What do you want? When do you want them? And how do you want them? Open your mouth and speak, and so shall it be in the name of Jesus. So shall it be in the name of Jesus. Be specific on what you want. Just declare it, what you want, whatever you want, say it. And it shall be so in the name of Jesus. So it is in the name of Jesus. Don't stop speaking. Don't stop speaking. Begin to pray. Let's settle the matter. Let's settle the matter. What exactly do you want? When do you want it? And how do you want it? Open your mouth and speak. And so shall it be in the name of Jesus. So shall it be in the name of Jesus. So shall it be in the name of Jesus. So shall it be. In the name of Jesus, begin to pray. Don't stop praying. Don't stop praying. What exactly do you want? In the name of Jesus, begin to declare it. And so shall it be. In the name of Jesus, so shall it be. In the name of Jesus, don't stop speaking. Let's settle the matter. Let's settle the matter. And so shall it be. In the name of Jesus, so shall it be. In the name of Jesus, so shall it be. What do you want? This is a good week. Do you believe this week is a good week? What do you want this week, starting from today? What good news do you want to hear? What news are you expecting to hear this week? You know, what good things do you believe will happen to you this week? Open your mouth and declare them, and so shall it be in the name of Jesus. So shall it be in the name of Jesus. Open your mouth and declare and so shall it be in the name of Jesus. So shall it be in the name of Jesus. So shall it be in the name of Jesus. So shall it be in the name of Jesus. So shall it be in the name of Jesus. Begin to declare, begin to declare what you want, and it shall be so in the name of Jesus. So shall it be in the name of Jesus. So shall it be in the name of Jesus. So shall it be. What exactly do you want? Open your mouth and speak, and it shall be so in the name of Jesus. So it is in Jesus' mighty name we have prayed.
Amen and amen. What a mighty God we serve. I would like to pray for you, but before then, we're going to go through the word declaration. It's our culture to confess certain scriptures. You know, some scriptures we have carefully selected, we confess them. When you confess the word of God and believe in your heart, they come to pass in your life. So this is an important segment of this uh, program. I want you to confess the words with, with belief, with confidence, you know, with authority. Speak them. So I'm going to put the scriptures on the screen. I will say them. Then you repeat after me. So at the end of that exercise, I will pray for you. I will speak into your life. I will bring the meeting to an end. So the next uh, thing you see on the screen will be the scriptures. Okay? I believe and confess that Jesus Christ is my Lord, my Master, and my Savior. The life I live now is no longer mine. But Christ that lives in me to do his will and his good pleasure. My life is hidden with Christ in God. Therefore, whom shall I fear? Nobody. No weapon fashioned against me shall prosper. No evil counsel against me will prosper. The Lord shall deliver me from every form of temptation. Because I'm planted in the house of the Lord, I will flourish in the courts of our God. Oh yes, I will flourish. I shall not lack anything good at all. Lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Oh yes. Oh yes, I have a goodly heritage. I will prosper in the area of marriage relationships, finance, and in every area of life. I shall stand before kings and not mere men. Hmm. I have the life of God in me. <laughs> so ye. <laughs> Therefore, no sickness, disease, Virus or infirmity can stay in my body. Hmm. My body is fruitful and I will have the number of children I desire. I and the children the Lord has given me are for signs and wonders. All my children will be taught by the Lord, and great will be their peace in Jesus' name. I refuse to worry about anything, mm. for the Lord causes me to triumph in everything. Oh, yes. Because I'm starting this week in his presence, I will go out with joy and be led forth in peace. My ears are under a commandment to hear good news throughout this week in the name of Jesus. The favor of the Lord will be with me, pursue me, and overtake me in everything I do this week in Jesus' name. And I will return with testimonies in the name of Jesus. I have said it, and so shall it be. So shall it be in the name of Jesus. I have declared them, and they shall come to pass in the name of Jesus. So it is in Jesus' name, in the name of Jesus. I pray for you. This is a good week for you in the name of Jesus. I have declared it, and it is good. There's nothing anybody can do about that. It is good for you. This week must be good for you. 
you know, you will enjoy the benefits of this week. This week has some benefits. Every day has some benefits. The Bible says that we reap from the benefits of the day. You will reap from the benefits of this week in the name of Jesus Christ. This week shall be good for you. Good news you will hear throughout this week. You will not hear any bad news in the name of Jesus. Things shall work out well to your advantage throughout this week. You will be at the right place at the right time. No stribulate will touch you. No evil will be for you. No weapon fashioned against you will prosper in the name of Jesus Christ. No wolf in a sheep clothing can manifest near you. They will be exposed in the name of Jesus Christ. Whatever you do this week, it shall prosper. You are like a tree planted by the streams of water, which produces fruit in season. You produce fruit in season, you produce fruit out of season. Your leaf will always be green. Anything you do will prosper. We prosper in the mighty name of Jesus. The favor of the Lord will be with you. We pursue you in everything you do. In your going out, the favor will be with you. In your coming, it will be with you. In your thoughts and your actions, the favor of the Lord will be with you in everything you do, in every area of your life, you are favored. In the area of marriage, you are favored. In the area of health, you are favored. In the area of finance, you are favored. In the area of visa, you are favored. In every area of your life, you are favored. In everything you do, you are favored. In the name of Jesus Christ. If you are not yet married, I declare that this year is your year of wedding. Nothing can stop you from getting married this year before the end of three weeks from now. You will commence your wedding plans and we surely get married this year. I've declared it and it is so in the name of Jesus. So it is in Jesus' name. If you are believing God for a pregnancy miracle before the end of April 2023, your pregnancy will be confirmed and you will deliver safely in Jesus' name. I've declared it and it is so in Jesus' name. If you are believing God for a job miracle, you will get that dream job of yours this month of March. 2023 in Jesus name. If you are believing God for visa or permanent in the country of residence, you will have it before the end of April this year in the name of Jesus Christ. The Lord will continually be with you. He will not depart from you. And because he is with you, no one can be against you. No evil can be for you. No trap of the enemy can catch you. He will deliver from every form of trap and from every form of evil. You will not be scared of anyone because the Lord is with you. And if he's with you, who can be against you? The Lord will bless and protect you. He will bless and protect your spouse. He will bless and protect your children. He will bless and protect your parents. He will bless and protect your siblings. He will bless and protect everything that concerns you and be, that belongs to you and everyone that's related to you. All your loved ones are protected and blessed in the name of Jesus. It is well with you in Jesus' name. It is well with you in the name of Jesus. The Lord will bless you so much this week. This is a good week for you. I've declared it, and it is so in Jesus' name. So it is in Jesus' name. So it is in the name of Jesus. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen and amen and amen. What a mighty God we serve. Our God is indeed a mighty God. Before we close, I want to do something I've not done before. I want to put... A, I want to put a, a video. I want to put a video on the screen. Just hold on a second. Then I'll tell you what you will do before we close. We we'll have about two more minutes to leave. I'll try and finish. We we'll have about a minute more. There about. I'll try and finish before we leave. Mm. 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 If I'm not able to do the interview another day, something powerful I wanted to do, it's going to be another day. Anyway, don't forget our program is on Saturday, this Saturday at 6 a.m. Nigerian time to be on, on all my social media platforms. Impossible is nothing. Get set for that program. Invite your loved ones. Let them come, believe in, follow them up, make sure they are there. Do it and use the invitation as a point of contact for God to meet with you at your own point of view, okay? Just come expecting. We believe that great things will happen. 
but come expecting so you can experience them. God bless you. I love you. And uh, those of you in Nigeria will pray for you, that the Lord will protect you. And no evil before you as, a, as you go through the election period in Nigeria, the Lord will preserve you and protect you in Jesus' name. God bless you, everyone. I love you. And uh, you will surely have a good week ahead in the name of Jesus. A week full of testimonies in the name of Jesus Christ. So it is in Jesus' name. So it is in the mighty name of Jesus. So shall it be in Jesus' name. God bless you. I love you. Au revoir. Are you single and searching? Come and receive your mate. Are you married looking for peace? God is never late. Singles and married. Married. Empowering you to marry. Singles and married. Married. Living a life of bliss. This is your moment. Married. Empowering you to come to singles and married. Married. Living a life of bliss. Oh, are you single and searching? Yeah.